welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Father Jeffrey Kirby, author of Lord, Teach Us to Pray, and it's published by St. Benedict Press. Great to have you back on thank Bookmark. You, yes, thank you, Doug. Back here, I know you've written, uh, I think this might be your fifth book. We've, we've had a chance to talk about a couple of books. I know the yes. other one had to do with uh, uh, basically uh, His Holy Court, A Walk Through St. Peter's. Yes. Uh, which was one you've had. Now, this is Lord, Teach Us to Pray. Uh, and you dedicated this to the men of the Drexel House, Charleston, South Carolina. What is the Drexel yes. House? Well, it's a great opportunity uh, for young men to live in community. So it's not necessarily a discernment house, but we took an old convent, created it basically into a place for young men to live. So ages 20 to 35, where they're either in upper class college or graduate school or young mm -hmm. adult professionals, a place to have faith and virtue, prayer as a part of their early formation to find their place. So. In the four years we've had the Drexel House, 36 men have passed through and uh, have either gone to the seminary mm -hmm. or proposed to their girlfriends or entered right. some type of ministry in the church. So uh, a Christian community for single adult mm -hmm. men. So now, you live there too? I do, yes, yes. Now, do you find the benefit in, in having that camaraderie? <laughs> I do. And, uh, and actually kind of almost like playing a very different role in terms of spiritual fatherhood. like. Mm -hmm. Remind the guys to turn off lights and <laughs> put out the garbage and stuff of that. Well, you're um, right there with the encyclical the Holy Father just put out. The, well, that's right. Turning lights out and that's take, recycling. Cutting down yeah. on the garbage, exactly. make sure you exactly. recycle. Yes. So you're and, you're yeah. on the cutting edge. Sure, and <laughs> I start to more and more sound like my dad. It's <laughs> 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 like, turn off Isn't the lights. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> you know what's worse? I hate to tell you, when you look in your mirror and you see your dad. <laughs> that's great. Been there, done that one. <laughs> and now I'm starting to look like my grandfather, so uh, it's really getting scary. Now, in the forward to the book, which was written by Archbishop Peter Sartain, right? Yes. Uh, I thought this was interesting. For the Christian, everything flows from discipleship in the Lord Jesus, which is to say that Jesus called us all to be his disciples. I thought he called us all to be his friends. Mm. Are disciples and friends the same thing? It really is. In, in, in Christian theology, there, it really is a, the two sides of the same coin in the sense of by acknowledging his lordship, we enter into discipleship, and then by being disciples, we then mm -hmm. enter into intimacy, friendship with him. So uh, it's both hands, because no one can enter into a friendship with the Lord without first acknowledging his lordship. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be presumptuous. Right, but, by, but, but then as a disciple, that means one's committing, like you said, in, into the lordship means that I'm, in a sense, giving myself over to his directions yes. in my life, right, yes. to follow that. Yes. Not as just a friend who might have some uh, friendly advice for me that sure. I may or may not take, right? Exactly, he likes counsel or it's like, no, right. 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 It's, a, okay. it's a very different type of friendship, but a friendship nonetheless. Very we, we talk right in the beginning of Matthew 16, 22, 23, which has a great line, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Peter's argument against Jesus' cross, and this is in the foreword written by the bishop, archbishop, Cross and resurrection exposes the fact that he's not following, but wants to create his own path, one that makes sense to him. He would prefer that Jesus follow his way, his rational, his plan for salvation. Is that what most of us do, are really trying to do? If we're disciples, we're trying. <laughs> you know, we're trying to say, "I love you, Lord," but here's how about this way? We are, and 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 that's kind of like the fallenness. And and the great thing about the discipleship and the friendship is that it, it's what calls us back. So. Sometimes it's guilt. Uh, hopefully, as we grow in our discipleship and friendship, it it really is love. Like, I say this, I'm doing this. I, I need to come back, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's that type of conversion and, and constant welcome that I think really is a mark of the Christian way of life. Along the way of discipleship, and he talks about you here. He helps us to know and our know Him, I meaning the Lord, and ourselves better. He reveals our faults in the healing context of His mercy. Yeah. He forgives us and teaches us to be merciful ourselves. It is Christ who calls disciples, Christ who forms them, and Christ who sends them. How do you know if you're being <laughs> called? Is everyone called? Everyone is certainly called, but obviously in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so some will be called more in terms of the use of their reason, some in terms of their emotions. So the amazing thing about God is He created us with different temperaments mm -hmm. and personalities, and He'll respect that as He calls. And then there are deeper calls, like constant conversion, where He'll call us to greater mercy, greater love. And he will bring out particular expressions of virtue according to who we are. Mm -hmm. I will say, in terms of that, uh, the forward by the Archbishop, he preached my first Mass. Okay. And um, such a, a good guy, and, and uh, of course, has been in charge of kind of helping with the LCWR. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it was a great right. privilege for him to write that. Right. So. Well, also, you talk right in the introduction about that because uh, when you, uh, you say, in writing this book, I had drawn from my own discipleship and priesthood as well as my vocation ministry. You called it an amazing journey. That's the, you say, it was the celebration of my first mass as a newly <laughs> ordained priest, and you were very calm and relaxed, and you did everything <laughs> right. No, right? No. Okay. No. Oh. And out of that came the lesson, in a sense, that you have for this book, right? Absolutely. That was... It's the lesson that we, we all have to learn in our own discipleship. And for myself, it was my first Mass in particular. It was almost like everything came together in that moment. Uh, the first time that would that I'm celebrating what would be the mark of, of who I am, who mm -hmm. I've been called to be. And yeah, all the anxiety of, you know, making sure I do all the rubrics right, make sure I don't mess anything up, and, you know, make sure I don't disappoint people. Because, you know, first Mass, everybody's there. Everyone who right. is a part of my life, my formation. and. You know, I don't want to embarrass anybody, or you mm -hmm. know, all these things go on and on, and finally it's just like, calm down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, in the end, what's the important thing is, um, Lord, I want to be with you, and teach me how to follow you, and let me always come, be close to you, and, and pray, and, and be in conversation with you. So I, I thought that at the beginning of the book, you know, rather than it just being um, some, you know, removed book on prayer, like, no, this is a book that's born from my accompaniment in vocations work with young men mm -hmm. and young women with, with, with religious life. But more fundamentally, this is an expression of the lessons I had to learn right. in my own discipleship. And especially at the first Mass, I thought, well, let me share a funny story. <laughs> right, well, you talk about uh, these three things you have in the beginning here. One of them is, Lord, help me to believe. Yes. Oh. Why will you're a priest? Of course you believe. Of Don't course, believe? sure. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I know that prayer well. Yeah, exactly. Yes, why, yes. why is that the case? Why don't we just not we believe? Well, you know, because God just insists on being God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so oftentimes uh, we want to know everything. We want to know all the details, and and at times the Lord will allow it to remain mm -hmm. behind a veil. And he asks for trust, he asks for faith. So there is a wrestling match. I think for people who think that priests or leaders in the church do not have those moments, uh, of course we do. You mm -hmm. know, whether it's a school shooting, whether it's a right. shooting in a church, whatever it might be, right. uh, we have the same question. So you even had that horrible one that happened a few months back uh, in, in Charleston. In Charleston. Exactly, yeah, 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 the AME right. church and so right, on. Right. You know, so these questions, and, and the questions are not the difficulty. In fact, the person of faith exercises faith. You know, even mm -hmm. priests and so on. Like we turn to the Lord, Lord, help me believe, always. Now you say, my personal story, you were alleging, uh, alluding to that, applies to this book. In a small way, it reflects much of what is happening in our world today. What is it happening in our, in our world today that you see, and maybe that's reflective of your conversations with young people discerning vocations, right? Yes, um, well, there's, like, yeah, there's a lot. Um, first, I think just the difficulties that would make it easy to just give up on faith. Mm. I think also is the, there's a tsunami of secularism. I, I like that expression, Cardinal uh, World coined that term, that there is a secularizing force. I can live a perfectly good life and be okay without mm. God. Mm. That is a strong current in our society. Then there's also the tendency to privatize religion mm -hmm. or to be on one's own, to be autonomous. And you add all that together, first of all, it's difficult just being a disciple, but then on top of that, enter the realm of discernment where we're asking a young man or young woman to give everything to the priesthood of religious life. And sometimes that can be almost suffocating unless there's that first and primary work in discipleship. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things you mention here later in the book, and I don't have it right in front of me, but it, but it starts off with that uh, kind of like the uh, that no one can have a personal relationship with Christ <laughs> yes. and I thought whoa and now you go on to explain a little more explain a little more exactly uh, and and it's it's a fine point in theology but I, I thought it was an important one in that if we we are called to have a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ but never in the understanding of an individualistic one so am I called to have a personal mm -hmm. relationship with Jesus Christ yes of course but always in the midst of the church like I cannot have a relationship with Jesus Christ unless I'm a member of the community in which God has formed this covenant. Mm -hmm. So if I think that I'm gonna have an individual, individualistic relationship with Jesus Christ, just I'm out there doing my own thing and, and so mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, very esoteric, very self-contained and so on. Uh, that's not biblical, it's mm -hmm. not Christian. That's, uh, that is not the same. Yeah, because the, the church was always a community. Absolutely. A and the relationship there. Uh, you also say it is meant to help the reader this book is both a workshop and a laboratory. 
Yes. What, what do you mean a laboratory? Yes, where we just try things out. Um, you know, there are some things that I draw from the, the spiritual treasury of the church that mm -hmm. work with some people and do not work as well with so other people. So you kind of, it, there Test isn't it. one just, this is what you got to do. No, gosh. Because there's lots of spiritualities, lots of different people. Absolutely. And you have to just go in and try. So and you take what works for you. Yes. Yes. Essentially. The other thing you talk about right at the beginning basically is dealing with the whole idea of baptism and really getting into the idea, who do you say I am? I was actually in the middle of a wonderful book that Father Mitch wrote years ago, mm -hmm. who, do we, mm -hmm. who do you say I am? But that seems to be the crux of a lot of problems today because, you know, the question is, uh, you, you mentioned C.S. Lewis's famous thing about uh, Jesus is either Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. Yeah. Today, though, when you say people try to absorb Jesus of Nazareth into a broad conglomerate of recognized spiritual teachers and they avoid Jesus' direct question, who do you say I am? It, are they doing that because it's a way to avoid any kind of call on how they live their lives? I do, uh, yes, and, and however cognitive or aware they are of that. I, I think, first of all, there's that uh, very American uh, tendency to syncretize mm -hmm. and, and generalize, and, and we just make everything the same. So, you know, we just put everything together and that's it. So, Jesus is just one of, of many in this chorus. And, and that is in direct opposition mm -hmm. to anything that he preached mm -hmm. or that he called for uh, or that he asked. Mm -hmm. Who do you say that I am? If you want to say that he's just one of the prophets, if you want to say that he's John the Baptist brought back from the dead, to modernize those answers, if you want to say he's a great prophet or a great miracle mm -hmm. worker, and that's it, well then you have conditioned the level of adherence mm -hmm. because to say that someone is the Lord, everything, that requires a lot more than to just say, well, he's a good prophet or one right. of many religious teachers. Well, this struck me, and whether you meant it this way or not, chapter two, Jesus Christ and Salvation History. Uh, the second paragraph, one response leads to another. In some ways, I think that's what scares people is because if it was just this, once saved, oh, you know, I do the sinner's prayer, mm -hmm. I'm all set, it's well, done, that's okay. But it seems to be the Christian walk like discipleship. It's a walk, yes. it's a process. In which case, I do the first thing, and then he comes knocking on my door about the next one, and the next, and though I might be okay with the one or two, maybe I'm not gonna be so happy with the third one. Yes, and, and, and at the heart of that is the real understanding that discipleship is marked by 100%. I remember years ago giving a homily, and I mentioned about 100%. Christian discipleship, our yes is 100%. Like, even if we don't get there, the fact that we know that that's the goal, and afterwards, I remember somebody asking me, you know, Father, do you really mean 100%? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, bit, that's a bit extreme, you know? That's the heart of everything this is, that no, 100%. And sometimes it's, it's, it's particularly the process of conversion and, and, you know, the spiritual writers refer to the peeling of the onion, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes it does. It, it takes a while, but we always know, like, I want to give 100%. The way I spend my money, the way I treat my body, the way I show mercy, the kindness I show to my neighbor. Uh, these can be very difficult virtues depending on our personality, our personal story. And it takes time, but there right. is that constant yes. And we see that with our Lord with the, the, the tale of the rich man and the, yes. the rich young man and things like that and holding on to things and not willing to give up everything, yes. so to speak. You say, if we begin to answer the Lord's question, who do you say I am, then we have to begin with God as a real personal being and not our imaginary friend God who will be whatever we want him to be. I remember years ago, it was a horrible movie where they had a statue and it was called the Buddy Christ. Mm. And it was kind of like this, that whole oh. idea like, hey, coming right back at you, you know, yes. I'm cool with you, you're cool with me. And, and that seems to be what a lot of people like to think our Lord is supposed to be like, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I know uh, certain recovery programs very much nurture that. I know that uh, certain groups, especially Christian communities, when they find themselves uh, really removing themselves, compromising from biblical truths, then you're forced to... to right, and as a number of people actually show up, they think by making it easier or get more people, it doesn't work that way. No, no, and, and so they just start creating this person that, you know, is going to be this kind of mass, general, kind of a huge, warm, fuzzy, sure, everybody, mm -hmm. and so on, whereas once you begin to understand, no, God is real, and he has shown us in, in the series of covenants who he is. And in the son Jesus Christ, he has shown us the fullness. And this is what it means to worship God, to follow him. And we don't change God, God changes us. And once we begin to accept that basic truth in discipleship, mm -hmm. that's when the adventure really begins. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that also has to do with the, the way people, especially today, have a fear of commitment. 
because yes. people are afraid of being let down. And like you said earlier in the interview, kind of loss of the sense of the authority you can count on. Yes. Now, in the chapter on my faith and the church's, church's faith, you say, as the Lord himself would challenge us, and this is from Revelation 3.15, I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold, were that you cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And, you, and, and that is always one of the people go, whoa, yes. uh, so am I better off being cold uh, well, than, than being lukewarm? You say this exhortation should not frighten or intimidate us, but should emphasize accentuate how utterly important our answer to the Lord's question truly is in our lives and our true discipleship. So yes. how do you deal with that? You know what I mean? Am I better off? Obviously, I'm better off being hot for the Lord in a sense of what it is. Sure. But if, I'm, if I don't care and I don't do it, well... Is yes. it that he's ignoring us, or is he just not even <laughs> bothering to talk about how bad it's going to be for you? Right. I, I think that, um, not to avoid that question, but I think the, I really just want to stress how much the Lord is calling us to mm -hmm. complete surrender, mm -hmm. you know, in that series of, of conversions. You know. Oftentimes when people hear that passage, when it comes up in, in the lectionary and so on, people get nervous because they know they are not where they need to be. And the, I always try to encourage people, mm -hmm. the underlying question there is, do you know you need to to be there, like, mm -hmm. do you desire that? I mean, Matthew 5, 6, which is a great consolation to me and to those that I direct or preach when I preach and mm -hmm. spiritual direction and so on is, you know, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for holiness, they shall have their fill. So I tell people, relax, the Holy Spirit's doing the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, all we have to do is hunger and thirst, right? and we leave the results to God. You need to be open. That's it. And you need to be listening. Exactly. Lord, I okay. want to be holy. And you also, but at the same time, you say you need to make a personal decision for Christ. Yes. Yes. Why do Catholics have it? We're we baptized. Yeah, um, we, somewhere along. But, you know, the, that comes up so often. In fact, that part of the book, I think, is, is, a, is an unnecessary challenge to, to Catholics in that, you know, oftentimes it's believed, well, no, we don't, that sounds like kind of like the non-Catholics. That's yeah, like the Protestants Protestant and so on. Kind of thing, yeah. And I, I retrieved that part from St. Paul where he says, you know, you have to fan into flame what's been given to you. And, you know, the sacraments are powerful, but the ma sacraments are meant to assist us in our relationship with Christ. And the sacraments all presuppose faith. Even if in baptism, it's the faith of the parents. So we get all this grace from the sacraments in order to be with Christ, and we have to fan it into flame. And throughout the history of the church, we've heard this. Vatican II said it four times. And if you had to summarize the pontificate mm -hmm. of JP2 in one expression, that would be it. Mm -hmm that the human person is called to make a personal decision for Jesus Christ and be transformed into him. But in the context of the community. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. and not a once for all kind of a situation, yes. but in, in a sense almost like an ongoing Yes, and commitment. I think that's why as Catholics we shied away from the language for the last 400 years or so because it sounded so Protestant-y and because the way it was being understood, well, no, if one has a personal relationship with God, then they're away from the community, they do their own thing. Right. But that's not the biblical understanding, nor our understanding in our tradition. But I think we have to retrieve it. Right. And I love the quotes by JP too that are in the book about right. we really have to make this personal decision for mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Part two, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Luke 6, 46 yeah. under teach us. That seems to be a predominant thing today. There's many people, you know, obviously we have the new atheism. We have people who say, I don't know what I believe. I don't know. I'm kind of religious, but I'm not, uh, or I'm spiritual, but I'm not yeah. religious, all this other stuff. Or, yeah, I believe what Christ teaches, but I just don't follow everything the church tells me. Yes. And is there a difference, in, and there seems to be a difference in people's minds today. There didn't used to be. No, and, and, and it's interesting because um, there was a, there used to be a really popular bumper sticker, so Jesus, yes, church, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, at the time when, when he was a pope, uh, Benedict XVI really challenged that. He said, it would be like seeing a head walk removed from the body. Mm. You know, like it's, it's the same, like there is no discontinuity. Like, the, you know, Christ is found in, in the community, in the church. And it's in the church that we encounter the true Christ. So the two have to go together. Very important. Now, you alluded to this earlier in talking in this chapter, virtue and the Lord's question, many spiritual books do not address virtue, but jump directly to spiritual theology or to methods of prayer. While these aspects are important, the role of virtue needs to be explored. Why? Yes, and, and I'll tell you, I was kind of surprised by that because, you know, if you look at the spiritual books of, the, of our tradition and up until, you know, 1950s, 60s, and so on, uh, you see this, this almost balance, these two lungs almost of prayer and, and virtue. But then all of a sudden, virtue just kind of fades away. Mm -hmm. And some of our more contemporary books, uh, even by notable, really good authors, 
where the book simply becomes a lot of discussion on the importance of prayer or the methods of prayer and various things. But, you know, one can't really grow in a spiritual life or in a life of prayer if their heart is removed from God, mm -hmm. if they're not at least desiring virtue mm -hmm. and that conversion of heart. So the two really do have to go together. So I reference it's like um, being in a boat and learning how to sail. You know, that's like prayer. You're like, yeah, good, I'll figure it out. But then you realize that you're on the wrong side of a dam in the dry part, and that boat's, it's not going anywhere, <laughs> you know? Right. So, you know, virtue is, is breaking down the dam and letting the water in. Mm. So one has to have both. Now you talk uh, in that chapter, Virtue and Life of the Spirit, via not versus. Oftentimes we want to draw a contradiction between God's law and freedom. Yes. Seeing the two intention as one versus the other, the reality, however, that it's, it's not versus between God's law and freedom, but rather a rapport of via, yes. meaning by way of, which demonstrates that the law is in service to freedom and freedom benefits from the discipline of the law. I think that's the part that mm -hmm. most people don't seem to get when it comes to their faith, which is these are not things to hold you back. These are, are, are ways in, of living your life to make your life better yes. in this world and yes. in the next, not yes. just in the next. Yes. And people don't seem to have a problem with that when it comes to how many, uh, you know, gluten they, how much gluten <laughs> right, they have, or right. they're not supposed to do this. So if you want to look like that, you got to be in shape, sure. you got to work out. That they seem to understand that if there's no pain, there's no gain. Mm -hmm. But in the spiritual life, they don't, they're not so happy about that. Right. Exactly. But they seem to find that as a contradiction. Exactly, they forget that if there's no cross, there's no crown. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people in a similar way will juxtapose relationship to rules. And, and I hear this so often, and, and I'm trained in moral theology, I have a license mm -hmm. in, in moral theology, I, I cringe when I hear this. When people say, well-intentioned people, uh, Christianity or Christian discipleship or the Catholic Church, it's not about rules, it's about relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, that is verses. Mm -hmm. um, because Good point. the rules are over here, but it's all about relationship. I, we, we know the point they're trying to make, the well-intentioned ones, which is the important thing is the relationship, but the relationship is matured and ordered and develops precisely because of the rules. Mm -hmm. So it's not versus, but it's this via, the rules are a part of it. So if someone were to say to me, well, it's not about the rules, it's about relationship. Uh, imagine if a married man were to say that, and I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's not about the rules, it's just about the relationship. So, you know, your wife shouldn't have to tell you where she is. She should never have to indicate, you know, spending or, so, you know, all these things. And the person said, what are you talking about? Of course. Yeah. Like, oh, so there are rules in this relationship. Right. Well, no, they're not rules. That can help condition the relationship, sure, whether sure. it's going to be healthy or not. Yes, and eventually the rules right. aren't even seen as rules. It's just... So it's just a part of it. It's the normal way of living. Exactly. So it's going to Sunday Mass. Right. right. Going to Sunday Mass and being with our, our Lord and Creator. It's, you know, treating one's body well. It's right. uh, showing mercy. And so suddenly these aren't rules because they're in the relationship, right. but the rules are there. I remember the late, great uh, Monsignor Smith used to say, like with the fundamental option, I fundamentally love you, my wife, but I am going this weekend away with my secretary. Right, right, right. Uh, right. We, <laughs> call it the, we call it the fun option. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know, right. It's like, it's it doesn't, not quite, fun, right? doesn't quite work that exactly, way. Exactly, right, right. But people, I will say people think that way mm -hmm. in our culture and then in their faith. Well, but I really love God. I don't have to go to church. Well, he knows or, in my heart what I believe. Yes. I mean, why do I have to yes. prove it to him? I mean, he knows. Yes. Right? yes. And if they were to try that, if anyone were to be in a relationship with them as friends or spouses or significant others, and they were to try to approach them in that way, right. they would never tolerate that. It never that. worked that way. Now, you also talk, when we talk about rules. We've got the rule of life. Yes. The spiritual tradition of the church passes along a means of holiness called the rule of life. The rule of life is composed by each of us for our daily life. So what is the rule of life? You even have a motto here. That's right. Yes, you have a motto? I do. I What's do. your motto? <laughs> well, I stole it from the Jesuits at Madrum Dei Gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Okay. So uh, I went to a Jesuit. So you University. got lines here. Am I supposed to, if I'm going through this book, sit down and write a motto for my Absolutely, life? Absolutely, yes. I, I, they were Should left I in pray there. before I decide yes. what it is? Oh, would yes, be? yes. Especially in general, especially the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I will say, Doug, that is the most popular part of the book. Is it really? It is. And, and you know, stressing the fact have that... Have you seen you know, some of the ones people come up oh, with? Yes, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And then they've have asked... Have you been well, impressed? I have been. Right. Yes, yes. Surprised? And yes, yes. And because, you know, the rule of life, when it's done well and prayerfully, mm -hmm. um, People see things about themselves, and to the degree that they disclose it to myself as a, as a priest, um, yes, very much so. Yeah, and you have the kind of the examine, uh, that whole idea of the examine prayer and particular examination, reform of your life. Do you think it helps people, I mean, the way you did this, sometimes that people need to 
take it and, and put it down on paper Absolutely. and be able to physically look at it yes. to yeah. really say, is that really what I believe? Yes, yes. In fact, I, and I, at first I was cautious because you know, we never want to present you know, the, the spiritual life manualistically. Mm -hmm. However, especially for someone who's first starting to really draw close mm -hmm. to the Lord, really wants to fan into flame that grace. Uh, it almost has to be more structured than perhaps what it has to be later. So while some might say that's oh, manualistic, um, I, I wouldn't agree with that, but mm -hmm. I don't really care because at the end, someone was first starting, you know, and they started filling this out, you know, and they realized, wow, this dominant defect, you know, I, right. I am really jealous. Like I never realized that that oh, is right. the, the bad spirit that, you know, motivates so right. many of my sins. And it works. Right. And the young adults who have tried this book and the adults and the young men in formation who have tried this, they say, you know what, it, it works. This, right. It actually changes my life. It lets, it lets grace transform. Well, one of the things I know in Marriage Encounter, one of the things they talk about is, uh, in the beginning, is what you spend, what's important to you. Now make the list of what you spend your time on. You usually find they're in direct opposition yeah. to one another, and mm -hmm. it helps you to say, wow, why am I spending so much time on things that aren't important to me and so mm -hmm. little time on the things that I claim are? Mm -hmm. So That's the question good. is, do, am I screwed up with that way, or am I lying to myself about what's important? Yes. And maybe i got to get my priorities straight. But well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. You got another book in the works? Or? Uh, maybe. We'll okay, see. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> Always happy to see Father Jeffrey Kirby, STL, Lord Teach Us to Pray, published by St. Benedict Press, A Guide to the Spiritual Life and Christian Discipleship. And it's, again, published by St. Benedict Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Highly recommended. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.